This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce, uh, you know, uh, someone who I've, who I've admired for my whole career as a real uh, inspiration for all uh, Canadians. Um, Shamir uh, Mehta is a professor of medicine at McMaster University and Hamilton uh, Health Center and senior scientist at the, um, at the uh, uh, PHRI in Hamilton. Um, in 2004, he, he was named one of the Canada's top 40 under 40. Um, in 2022, he received the uh, Canadian Cardiovascular Society highest uh, award, the, the CCS uh, Research Award. He's is, is, is always been like a true inspiration uh, for, for a lot of people. Uh, there's, he's, he's, he's probably the interventional cardiologist, not probably, he's the interventional cardiologist that was the most, was, was had the most impact in his research uh, uh, over the last uh, 20 years for sure. Several uh, uh, New England Journal publication uh, led the Timex uh, study on uh, timing of ACS or the rival comparing radial versus femoral and a very successful complete trial as well. Um, so uh, it's, it's an honor to, to have uh, Shamir uh, with us this morning. Um, and um, and uh, I am 100% sure you will learn as much as I've learned in the past, uh, listening to his uh, extremely uh, deep uh, understanding of coronary artery disease and how, how we should manage it through the a trialist perspective. Um, Shamir, thank you. Great, thank you, Stefan. It, it's, it's great to see you uh, doing well in Atlanta. Um, do, we do miss you in Canada a great deal. And hopefully you'll be back uh, soon to see us in Tremblant uh, for the course there. Uh, That's like correct, That's, I'll done, see you next week. <laughs> so many years, okay, awesome. Uh, so, um, so thanks for inviting me, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my talk today will be on complete uh, revascularization in ACS. Uh, there's been a lot of recent data in this area, uh, and there's a lot happening uh, in this area. Uh, it seems that it's almost given coronary revascularization another shot in the arm, uh, and it's leading to uh, more trials and, and more work uh, in this area. So I'll start with a case history. This is Grand Round. So uh, I'd like to, you know, put a case in here. Uh, so this is a case, a, a real case, a 49-year-old uh, gentleman who uh, had been experiencing two hours of retrosternal chest pain and, and diaphoresis. Uh, he called EMS. He had an ECG done at the scene, and the ECG showed an inferior STEMI. Uh, this gentleman had no prior cardiac history. In fact, he had been at his uh, daughter's wedding for most of the day, and he had woken up in the middle of night, uh, woke up his wife, and uh, that's when they decided to call uh, EMS. Um, he had no known risk factors other than uh, smoking one package of cigarettes per day. Um, he did, it does turn out he had a family history of CAD, a father uh, had an MI at the age of 45, died at the age of 50, and a brother had an MI at the age of 47 and had cabbage surgery at that age. He had one episode of VF on, on scene, um, and he was promptly uh, defibrillated by EMS. Um, this gentleman was in a hospital that was probably about uh, 40 minutes away from uh, Hamilton General Hospital, which is the uh, STEMI center. Uh, it's a very large STEMI center. As Stefan knows, our um, cardiac centers in Canada are, are really very large. Uh, we, we do between 900 and 1,000 STEMIs a year, total 8,000 procedures a year for a population of about 2 million uh, people. Um, so, uh, and, and we have about 16 or 17 feeder hospitals to our, our tertiary care center. This gentleman was in one, uh, was in one area closer to a small hospital, but he actually had a STEMI bypass uh, from that institution. This was his ECG when he got to the cath lab in the middle of the night, and he had uh, an occluded proximal right coronary artery, which was his culprit lesion, not surprising. 
uh, and underwent successful primary PCI to that lesion with insertion of a drug eluting stent to the proximal RCA and restoration of flow. You'll see there is some ectasia in the vessel and some uh, distal disease, but no other flow limiting disease. Now on the left side of the heart, there was significant coronary disease. He had a proximal LAD uh, stenosis, which looks to be in the range of 80% visually. And he had a uh, circumflex lesion that was in the range of about 70%. 60 to 70 percent. Uh, and these were the, the non-culprit lesions. This case uh, was at a time before 2015 when the HACC guidelines, believe it or not, it wasn't that long ago, folks, had uh, PCI to these non-culprit lesions listed as a class three recommendation. Don't do it. Uh, it's associated uh, with harm. Um, so this gentleman was actually treated medically, and I'm going to come back to this case. But since that time, since about 2012 or so, uh, we've had six uh, really good trials that have compared complete revascularization uh, with culprit lesion only PCI, specifically in patients with STEMI. It all started with the provocative uh, PRAMI trial, uh, modest size trial uh, that was done in one country in the UK, and then we had culprit, DNAMI 3. Uh, and compare acute, and all basically showed the same uh, finding that complete revascularization appeared to be better than a culprit lesion only strategy. But this difference was driven mainly by a difference in revascularization of the non culprit lesion, um, which is a good finding, uh, but uh, in an open label trial, obviously is associated with bias uh, because one group uh, gets. Uh, complete, uh, one group has PCI, 100% have PCI to the non culprit lesion, the other group 0%. So one group is not even eligible really for that endpoint unless they have restenosis or some other complication. Um, so the big question people were asking, um, not only the interventional cardiologists, but really the non interventional cardiologists were asking, um, you know, what about hard endpoints? Is there a benefit of PCI? Uh, on hard endpoints. And that's the reason that we actually uh, designed the complete trial. We designed it not like the other trials. We, we wanted a large trial. We wanted a, a trial to answer the question, yes or no, as to whether or not this strategy reduced hard endpoints. Um, so we had 31 countries, we had 140 sites, uh, and we had 4,000 patients that we enrolled, and we powered the study for hard clinical outcomes, not soft outcomes, not the outcome of revascularization, which we expected based on the other trials, but we powered it to see reductions in myocardial infarction. Um, and this was published in the New England Journal. You'll see here members of the steering committee, uh, but also the high ranking sites that put uh, patients in the, in the trial. Um, here is the, the flow diagram of the study, patients with STEMI, uh, and multivessel disease were enrolled if they had a non culprit lesion that was of reasonable caliber, defined as a lesion of more than 2.5 millimeters in diameter uh, and more than 70% visual stenosis, or if they had a stenosis between 50 and 69%, that had to be associated with a positive FFR. They were then randomized to receive complete revascularization, which, includes, which included routine staged PCI of all suitable non-culprit lesions. Stage PCI is PCI in a different setting than the primary PCI setting. A requirement for the trial, um, and I'll say it again, is that they had to have successful culprit lesion PCI. If they had failed culprit lesion PCI, uh, if there was no reflow, if they didn't get a good result, if they didn't open up the culprit lesion, they were not eligible for the trial. Um, or they received a strategy of culprit lesion only revascularization, where there was no further revascularization of the non-culprit vessels. It was a protocol violation to do a PCI on a non-culprit vessel unless they met very rigorous criteria in that setting. Uh, and all patients received guideline-directed medical therapy, uh, aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitor, far and away ticagrelor was the most common. Ticagrelor prazugril uh, use in the trial was about 90%, 10% um, clopidogrel, uh, and then statin, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and risk factor modification. We designed a long-term trial. The trials that have shown a benefit of PCI in general, uh, particularly in the cabbage um, setting, 
and on hard outcomes such as mortality and MI have not been short-term trials. They have been long-term trials outside of the setting perhaps of primary PCI. Uh, in, 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 um, in, in terms of uh, multivessel coronary disease, the benefits have been seen uh, with long-term follow-up for multivessel disease, which is why we designed a long-term trial uh, with a result at three years. And we didn't, we didn't look at the results earlier. Um, the last patient to be followed in the trial was about five or six years because median follow-up was uh, three years in the trial. And there were co-primary outcomes, the first being CB death or new MI, and the second being CB death, new MI, or ischemia-driven revascularization. This is where the patients came from. We used our global network uh, at McMaster to um, participate in this trial. Uh, most of the centers actually were in Western Europe. So the UK, France, Spain, and Italy were the four main countries in uh, Western Europe. But a close second was North America, Canada, and the US. Or a close second with uh, 1,700 patients. And then we had a smattering of patients from South America, South Africa, uh, the Middle East and the Asia Pacific uh, region, particularly Australia and, uh, and China. China didn't put very many patients in uh, this trial uh, at all. And you'll see here the results of the trial. Uh, on the left-hand side for CB death or new MI, uh, the first co-primary outcome was reduced in the trial by 26%, uh, tight confidence, in, confidence intervals, and a p-value of 0.004. So really an unequivocal benefit on heart outcomes uh, with a number needed to treat over a period, a median period of three years of 37 patients to prevent one CV death or new MI. On the right-hand side is with the uh, additional um, endpoint of, of ischemia-driven revascularization. This was very strictly adjudicated ischemia-driven revascularization. They had to have uh, symptoms. Um, they had to have had uh, ischemia by either non-invasive testing, or they had to have a flow wire with a uh, positive FFR uh, or a positive non-hyperemic index uh, in order to meet the diagnosis of IDR. Um, and the committee that assessed IDR was a blinded committee, blinded to treatment assignment. Uh, and this was led at the University of Alberta, a separate institution. Here, the reduction was a 49% relative risk reduction, and it was highly statistically significant with an NNT really very low uh, of 13 patients to prevent uh, one of these events. Here are the actual events in the trial, looking at the co-primary outcomes, the CB death or new MI. Uh, I do wanna point out uh, for you here that, you know, here we're talking about hundreds of events. You know, often you'll see you know, presentations, presenting clinical trials, uh, and they'll, you know, some of them are small clinical trials, some of them are large clinical trials, they're all kind of mixed together. Um, it's really important when we're looking at hard outcomes to focus, to look at trials and the, um, and, and the reliability of the trial based on its sample size, yes, but really it's the number of outcome events that determine statistical power within a trial. So here um, in this trial, you know, we're looking at hundreds of primary outcome events. Um, we're not looking at tens of outcome events or, or 50 or, or 60 outcome events. There are hundreds of cardiovascular outcome events. Um, and that leads to the high statistical power. And that also allows us to detect a treatment effect, a moderate treatment effect, should that treatment effect exist. Um, you'll see for the secondary uh, key secondary outcome, which included unstable angina and class four heart failure. Uh, we're looking at almost 700 uh, outcome events uh, for that particular outcome and, and a very robust uh, reduction of about 38% in these clinical outcomes. Now, one of the um, outcomes in the trial, cardiovascular death, uh, was not powered. You'll see we only had about 100 or so cardiovascular deaths uh, within the trial. There were numerically fewer cardiovascular deaths. All the trials have showed numerically uh, lower number of cardiovascular deaths. Um, and we did a meta-analysis. Kevin Bainey uh, did this meta-analysis from the University of Alberta, uh, looking at the main trials, PRAMI, Culprit, DYNAMI-3, Comparacute, uh, and complete, uh, and putting the data uh, together and showing about uh, one third reduction in cardiovascular mortality, and that was uh, statistically significant. 
So the totality of the data suggests that there may be, and I think we have to interpret it with caution, um, but there may be a, a reduction in uh, cardiovascular mortality as well with complete revascularization, which would make sense uh, with the reduction in non-fatal uh, cardiovascular events. Now, one of the issues that people have asked about is what about the timing of non-culprit re lesion revascularization? So within the trial, we knew that this would be an issue, but we also knew that we had to do a trial that was as seamless with clinical practice as possible. When we design these strategy-driven trials, the last thing you want to do, the last thing you want to do is to force an investigator to do something that is not within their standard of practice. They get out of their comfort zone, they start doing things they shouldn't be doing, and you end up with a negative trial. So you'll see all of our trials uh, that we have done, Timex and all of the strategy trials that we have done at McMaster have looked at clinical practice, the variation within clinical practice globally, and we've tried to tailor our clinical trial to match that clinical practice. Um, and so in this trial, we use staged complete revascularization. We looked at centers and uh, when they did the procedure, so some did it during the index hospitalization, some did it after the index hospitalization, a small number, very small number did it during the index procedure itself. So we decided to stratify our randomization for the timing of when a patient would have their non-culprit lesion PCI procedure. This was a pre-randomization stratification uh, when, uh, so it, so it, that means that when we look at the intended time from revascularization, it's a valid comparison. And you'll see here the hazard ratios for when patients had their procedure during the index hospitalization, a median of one day. So essentially the next day after their STEMI versus after the index hospitalization, they were sent home and they were brought back. Uh, you'll see there's absolutely no heterogeneity in the results. The interaction p-value uh, is negative. And you'll see that's true for the first primary endpoint and the second uh, primary endpoint co-primary endpoint of the trial, showing absolutely no heterogeneity in results according to when that non-culprit lesion was revascularized. So this gives the clinician options. If you have uh, an elderly patient uh, who may have renal dysfunction, who has vulnerabilities, uh, comorbidities, uh, frail, you don't want to bring them back to the cath lab too early, you want them to recover from their initial infarct, you can do that. If you have a patient where their culprit lesion is a right coronary artery, uh, they have a little bit of shock, they may have some RV infarction, they're hypotensive, they need that time to get over their RV infarction, usually a few days in hospital, you have that flexibility um, that to not intervene uh, at a time when a patient may be unstable. Um, so I think that's the message of the uh, timing component of this. Now, this is also interesting that when we look at the temporality of benefit in the trial, uh, we looked at within the first 45 days from randomization and then long-term from 45 days to three years after randomization. And within the first 45 days after uh, randomization, the curves are essentially superimposable with each other. Um, there doesn't appear to be this early you know, magical benefit of non-culprit lesion PCI early on. The benefit of complete revascularization for the patient emerges really after that period of time. So you'll see at one year, there's a separation in the Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, but the curves continue to separate all the way out until uh, in this um, uh, Kaplan-Meier curve up to uh, four years, median of three years overall in the trial. So the benefit of complete revascularization here like the benefit of complete revascularization that was seen in the trials of cabbage surgery that were done in the 1990s uh, are over the long term. Uh, very similar looking Kaplan-Meier curves, regardless of which modality of revascularization is used to achieve complete revascularization. We looked at several subgroups uh, in the trial. This is the subgroup according to patient age. Um, so remember, STEMI is a generally younger presenting patient population. The majority of patients presenting with STEMI have not seen a prior physician. This is often their first interface with the healthcare system uh, because it happens out of the blue. Um, and so the med median age in the trial was in the low 60s, 
we look, we predefined age less than 65 and greater than or equal to 65, and we saw very consistent results for the, both the first co-primary outcome and the second co-primary outcome. Uh, the same is true for diabetes status. Uh, diabetes status in the trial was a little bit lower, so known diabetes uh, at presentation in the trial because, again, it is a younger presenting patient population. The non-STEMI population is an older population. They have a, a high um, prevalence of diabetes. They have high comorbidities. The STEMI population is a younger population. They often have untreated diabetes or they don't know they have diabetes uh, when they present uh, with their STEMI, or they may have glucose intolerance. Um, so uh, in this uh, trial, uh, at least, we did not see any heterogeneity in results according to diabetic status. And we did an analysis. We allowed the use of a pharmacoinvasive strategy if that was necessary in some regions of the world. Turns out it was mostly used in rural areas, uh, in, in countries with large geographies. So in Canada, for example, our Western provinces like Manitoba, um, and uh, Saskatchewan uh, and uh, and um, in Edmonton, where Edmonton takes you know patients from the Northwest Territories, uh, they have to you know uh, they have to be airlifted down. They do use a pharmacoinvasive strategy. It was a small number of patients within the trial. Out of four thousand patients, there were only about three hundred patients. But again, it didn't seem to matter whether or not uh, it was a pharmacoinvasive strategy or a true primary PCI strategy, the results uh, were very, very consistent. Now, I just want to address very briefly the issue of uh, shock patients. So our trial shock was an exclusion criterion in the complete trial. Patients were not allowed to be included if they had shock. We do have a trial uh, looking at shock where they had immediate multivessel PCI versus a culprit lesion only strategy, the culprit shock trial, which did not show a benefit of immediate multivessel PCI. Um, and you'll see that the mortality or renal replacement therapy, almost mo uh, entirely mortality here at 30 days, uh, you know, about half of the patients with shock are essentially dead uh, after, uh, at, at 30 days. Uh, and there was no benefit of either strategy. Event rates were high, 46% versus 55% in both groups. So this is a patient population where you certainly would not attempt to do an immediate multivessel uh, PCI unless there were other compelling reasons that the clinician thought they had to proceed with that, or perhaps unless you had mechanical support uh, for that procedure. But I just want to make a couple of points about shock because it's a very different animal than a patient without shock. I mean, here we're looking at mortality of 55%. Uh, so essentially, half of your sample size is dead uh, by 30 days. So, you know, whatever the trial power that you had in this particular trial, it was 680 odd patients. You're now looking at a trial of 340 patients because remember the benefit of complete revask is long term. So you've essentially cut your statistical power in half to show any long-term benefit of a complete revascularization strategy. The other important point is that it's really hard to achieve complete revascularization in shock patients. Um, remember, complete revascularization is like compliance with a study drug. You do a trial of drug A versus drug B, people will look at your compliance of those drugs, and, that, uh, and if there is high compliance, then you maintain your statistical power. In complete, uh, our complete revascularization uh, was achieved, and this is rigorously defined in an angiographic core lab. All 4,000 uh, patients were, were uh, evaluated in a core lab, defined as a syntax score of zero, meaning no significant disease is left behind. That was achieved in 91% of patients in complete. In culprit shock, only 25% had true complete revascularization in the trial. So again, it's not surprising that there was no benefit. You know, if you had drug compliance in a trial of 25%, you almost certainly are going to have a negative trial before you even look at the results of that trial. Uh, so that is another challenge. It doesn't mean the trial was flawed or the investigators somehow didn't do their job. It just means that it's very difficult to achieve true complete revascularization in the setting of a shock, particularly when you're trying to intervene on a non-culprit vessel and the patient is on multiple inotropes, uh, you may be having to give the patient shocks multiple times during the 
uh, procedure and resuscitate the patient during the procedure, it's a difficult situation. And this is just some other data that the um, shock investigators uh, looked at. Um, when they're starting their procedure, they're looking at much higher syntax scores in much higher complexity of disease in these cardiogenic shock patients than, for example, a patient presenting with a STEMI in multivessel disease, like in the complete trial. Um, you'll see here uh, on that, th this is data from the angiographic core lab in complete. And you'll see that the syntax score here for multivessel disease was only about 16. Um, and this is compatible with the fact that, you know, they're young, relatively young patients and most have had no prior cardiac history. And most of that syntax score comes from the thrombotic nature of the culprit lesions. And the non-culprit lesion specific score uh, was about 4.5. So relatively straightforward uh, non-culprit lesions that the investigator could intervene on and be successful. That was the whole reason for the trial. The reason for the trial was to, to get to the bottom of whether or not complete revascularization offers a reduction in death or MI, CV death or MI. And we've answered that question. We've ended the debate. So now the issue is, um, can we extrapolate this to more complex lesions? And that's, that's a very good question that people are looking at. Now, what about angina status in the trial? We looked at quality of life and angina status. We did this with John Spertus and David Cohen. Uh, and uh, when we looked at angina at the end of the trial, uh, those patients who had complete revascularization felt better. Uh, there was about a 3% absolute uh, difference um, between the complete and the culprit lesion only group in any uh, residual angina by the end of the trial. Translates into uh, an NNT of 31. But really the patients, you know, when you look at a patient, it, it, you can't really just look at one endpoint like residual angina. If you look at what patients had to endure over the three years of the trial, um, this is really what they were, they were looking at, you know, the difference between the two groups in terms of cardiovascular events. And it's really striking when you look at the major cardiovascular events or residual angina, um, it doesn't really matter how you look at it. There were really sizable reductions um, in the trial with complete versus a culprit lesion only strategy. And this data was reviewed um, just last year by the ACC AHA Sky Guideline Committee for coronary revascularization. And they now have placed uh, complete revascularization uh, of non-infarct related arteries for STEMI as a class 1A recommendation. You can count on one hand the number of class 1A recommendations for PCI in these guidelines. Uh, and this now is one of them. And they've, very, they've chosen their words very carefully in the guideline uh, document and selected hemodynamically stable patients with STEMI and multivessel disease after successful primary PCI, staged PCI uh, of a significant non-infarct stenosis is recommended to reduce the risk of death or MI. Uh, so this is now part of the guidelines and it's had a significant impact. But there are still so many questions to answer. And one of them is, uh, how do we best achieve complete revascularization? And I do want to make a point that if patients have diffuse disease uh, or uh, left main disease, then cabbage surgery still is an important option. Incomplete, if a patient had multivessel disease and it looked like PCI was not a suitable option for that patient, uh, then they were excluded from the trial. And we have a cabbage surgery registry that we're continuing to do to just to get more points because this happens in less than 5% of, ca of, of cases. Um, so we need large, larger numbers in order to say anything important about what happens to patients needing cabbage after STEMI. Uh, but cabbage surgery is still a very important option that uh, should not be discounted. But I think of all of the findings that we, um, we saw incomplete and all of the various subgroups, I think this one, I think, struck us the most, um, a little bit unintuitive. Uh, but we looked um, in the angiographic core lab, all of the um, angiograms were reviewed for stenosis severity. And it appeared that when we looked at stenosis severity, looking at a greater than or 60% QCA non-culprit lesion stenosis, all of the benefit was in the tighter non-culprit lesions. Uh, and you'll see on the right-hand side for the less severe 
non-culprit lesions, about uh, a third of the lesions were less severe uh, in the trial, less than 60% QCA. Just for those of you who are not interventional cardiologists, a 60% QCA lesion is roughly, very roughly equivalent to about an 80% lesion on coronary angiography visual estimation. Um, and there's wide confidence intervals ar uh, around that. But that's kind of the, that, that's approximately the, um, the correlation. Um, so we found that this was a really important, not really important finding. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could identify everybody on the left-hand side and not do stenting for patients on the right-hand side, just treat them medically? we would greatly cut down on the number of unnecessary stents. But how in the world can we identify those patients on the right-hand side? We don't have online QCA uh, in uh, coronary cath labs. It's uh, completely uh, impossible. You'll see this difference, by the way, was e even larger when we add on the uh, third outcome of ischemia-driven uh, revascularization. Um, so before I tell you uh, what is next, I'm gonna go back to the case. Uh, uh, the case of the inferior STEMI. So it turns out the patient was treated medically for those non-culprit lesions, and he did well for four years. He was on high-dose statin. He was compliant with all his therapies. Uh, but four years later, um, had more chest pain, new onset, severe retrosternal chest pain. He called 911. An ECG uh, was done on the scene. Normally, if I'm doing this live, I'll ask for a show of hands uh, what they think the ECG showed. Anterior um, whether it was that proximal LAD lesion or whether or not it was the culprit lesion that may have been a problem. In fact, this time around, again, it was an inferior STEMI uh, that the patient was experiencing. And at this point, I'll ask usually the audience, uh, do you think it was the right coronary artery culprit or do you think it was the uh, circumflex culprit? The right coronary was the culprit lesion. Well, this is what the right coronary looked like. It looked almost identical to four years earlier. The stent is widely patent. There has been, despite the use of, of evidence-based therapies, there has been some progression in disease. Um, there's more ectasia in the vessel, uh, particularly just before the crux, you'll see more ectasia in the vessel. So there most certainly has been progression, but this is not the reason for the patient's uh, STEMI. We look on the right-hand side, You'll see there um, on, the, on, the, on the left, sorry, uh, you'll see a total occlusion of the circumflex uh, vessel. So it was that more moderate 70% uh, circumflex lesion that was responsible for the new plaque rupture four years later. What about that proximal LAD lesion? It's still tight. It was still around 80%, completely unchanged from four years earlier. Um, so the 70% lesion ruptured in that case, the 80% uh, proximal LAD lesion didn't seem to rupture uh, in that case. And we did FFR on this lesion after the fact, four years later, we didn't do it four years earlier, but four years later, and this was a positive FFR, uh, it was less than 0.8, and the patient ended up having PCI to this uh, vessel as well. We did not have the results of complete by the time this was uh, done. So the whole question here for this type of patients is what is actually going on here? You know, what predicts future cardiovascular events from non-culprit lesions? Why are we fooled all the time? How can we, how, is there any way that we can predict where we actually need to put our stents, which lesions we actually need to revascularize and can we be smarter about it? Well, one way is to use a physiology-based strategy. That certainly has worked in the stable setting, but is it enough? And is it enough to be able to identify an unstable plaque? Maybe we should be using um, intracoronary imaging on, like on the right-hand side uh, where they looked at, uh, where, where they uh, used OCT imaging. Um, and there's benefits and risks. I'll, I'll deal with physiology first. Physiology in the setting of stable angina is a great strategy for targeting your stent uh, for patients who will have a significant benefit from it. But in the unstable setting um, of ACS, it's a, it's a lot more uh, controversial. Why? Because in, um, in the ACS setting, we don't know what predicts the future of uh, cardiovascular event, whether it's the um, composition of the plaque, like a TICFA or thin cap fibroatheroma, which has a thin fibrous cap and a large lipid core. Is that predominantly the reason? Uh, is that the predominant driver of future cardiovascular events, or is it solely the stenosis severity? You know, if you, if you take a uh, plaque of 90%, uh, that is a fibrous calcific plaque, 
uh, does that have a greater propensity to cause a heart attack or death versus, let's say, a 70% plaque that's a thin cap fibroatheroma with a large lipid core? Which one would you rather have? Would you rather have the 90% calcific lesion or the 70% uh, TICFA lesion? You know, we kind of know everyone has their opinions, but we don't really have an answer. And again, we're now getting interventional cardiology to the point where we're trying to target the pathophysiology of the disease rather than just kind of going and stenting everything. So this, I think, is going to be the next era of coronary revascularization and how we move forward over the next decade or so. So I showed you the results with physiology-based imaging uh, and uh, the reduction in, uh, in events um, in the stable population. But remember, most of these plaques are fibrocalcific plaques, if not all of them. This is chronic stable angina. And there it seems that physiology-based strategy is, is, a, is a good way to go. Um, a meta-analysis in the uh, STEMI populations, looking at the trials that did use a physiology-based strategy, DNAMI-3 and Compare Acute, uh, did not show um, any heterogeneity with the trials that uh, used an angiography-based strategy, the culprit trial, the PRAMI trial, the complete trial. Uh, you'll see here the meta-analysis done by Kevin. Um, uh, the, the hazard ratios do not show any heterogeneity, perhaps a little bit of a deeper benefit with angiography-guided strategy, but really, I wouldn't say too much about it uh, because the confidence intervals overlap. But fortunately, we now have two head-to-head -head trials that have looked at this question. Unfortunately, both were relatively small trials. One was the FLOWER AMI trial, it was a French study, it was designed as a superiority study for FFR-guided PCI versus angiography-guided PCI. FFR-guided PCI resulted in about a third fewer non-culprit lesion PCIs being performed because they were deferred if they were FFR negative, um, but they did not see any significant difference in outcomes. In fact, at about eight months, it looks like the FFR-guided group may be experiencing more uh, events compared with the angio-guided group. Um, on the other hand, the FRAME uh, MI trial, which was just published in the European Heart Journal, uh, show the opposite. They, uh, again, a relatively modest trial. This trial was stopped uh, prematurely. Not, they were not able to get even 50% of their recruitment in the trial because of COVID. Uh, we all know how difficult it was to do things during COVID, so kudos to them for actually you know, publishing these data. But they showed the opposite. With the data that they have, they showed that there may be a benefit of an FFR-guided strategy. And you'll see the benefit starts relatively early. Now, a couple of things in this trial. Uh, they allowed immediate PCI in the trial, and they allowed the, pres uh, allowed the uh, enrollment of non-STEMI patients. So most of the patients actually in the trial, 60%, were non-STEMI. They weren't STEMI patients. Um, we did write the editorial on this. It was just released by the European Heart Journal a week or two ago, uh, comparing these two trials. Uh, and, and you'll see some of the, the comparisons here. The FRAME AMI trial, 562 patients. The FLOWER, 1,100 patients. But you'll see the event rates uh, in the trials just above that. The hazard ratio is strikingly different. Uh, FRAME AMI hazard ratio, 0.43. Flower AMI hazard ratio 1.32. Um, you know, they're kind of going in the opposite uh, direction. Um, we did write the editorial on this uh, and, and we titled it, I wrote it with Brian McGrath. He's one of our uh, senior PCI fellows. Anatomy versus physiology, how should we achieve complete revascularization in acute coronary syndromes? And uh, we made a couple of points. Uh, both were great trials, uh, but they were both underpowered, 54 outcome events and 56 outcome events. So be careful in interpreting the trials, um, probably not the size that we need in order to change our guideline recommendations. Um, in order to do that, we need hundreds of outcome events uh, to show um, a, a difference or a similarity between the two strategies. Um, the differences in patient populations, FLOWER was just STEMI, FRAME was both STEMI and non-STEMI. Uh, and, um, and so the question is, did the non-STEMI patient population in, uh, introduce any heterogeneity? When you look at the results, that's point number three here, all of the difference appeared to be in the non-STEMI population. The STEMI population, the results were very similar in the FLOWER and the FRAME uh, trials, uh, but it's the non-STEMI population which seemed to lead the benefit uh, in the uh, FRAME AMI trial. Again, difficult to know based on the data that we have, 
but uh, that does seem to be the case. Um, in the frame AMI trial, they saw this apparent reduction in mortality, uh, but it was kind of just out there, all cause mortality. Uh, it was significant within the trial, but there were very few deaths overall. Um, this has not been observed in any of the prior trials versus a culprit lesion only strategy, um, you know, much less uh, another complete revascularization strategy. Um, I'm not sure really what to make of it. It's interesting. Uh, and we need more information about when those events occurred. Um, did they occur because of the angio-guided group during the index procedure? Uh, we, we don't know, um, but we do know that a lot of the events were periprocedural and they happened on uh, day one or day two. And finally, frame was uh, terminated prematurely, uh, less than 50% of the recruitment. So that may have exaggerated the benefit. Uh, it doesn't mean that we throw the trial out. It means that we just consider the trial in the context of its premature uh, discontinuation. Now, one of the drivers, as I mentioned earlier, that may lead to future cardiovascular events is the composition of the plaque itself. And so can this in some way be complementary? So this is, um, uh, this is work done by uh, Natalia Pinello when she was, she was still a fellow uh, with us at the time. She's now uh, assistant professor on faculty. Um, but she, along with others, led the OCT complete uh, sub-study where we just wanted to know you know, we just wanted to know, are these non-culprit lesions, are they the fibrocalcific plaques that we're seeing in stable disease, or are they, do they look more like the culprit lesion? Are they thin cap fibroatheromas um, that are undergoing a similar pathophysiological process of that the culprit lesion underwent, just so happened the culprit lesion was the one that ruptured? Really important question. Uh, so we did three vessel uh, OCT imaging in a subset of those patients, and we found that about half about half of patients had an obstructive non-culprit lesion uh, that was a TICFA. So it had to be a significant lesion, more than 70%. And of those more than 70% lesions, one half of them uh, were thin cap fibroatheromas. Really interesting. Um, and the, the other thing that we noticed was that an obstructive non-culprit lesion were most likely to be vulnerable. So if you take an obstructive lesion, so angiographically significant lesion, uh, more than 70% uh, diameter stenosis on visual angiography, those lesions are much more likely to be uh, tick fuzz than a non-obstructive lesion, a lesion of lesser severity. Now, of course, there are more non-obstructive lesions than obstructive lesions. Uh, and it may be the non-obstructive lesions that are going to predict events over the very long term. But certainly when we see an obstructive lesion, uh, there, is, um, there is a good probability, about a one in two probability, that that non-culprit lesion is going to contain vulnerable plaque. That may be one of the mechanisms why we saw a benefit with the angiographic guided strategy. And what really launches us into complete two, which is going to start uh, next month, uh, recruitment next month. Um, this is going to be a large scale trial, uh, prospective randomized multicenter uh, trial, uh, looking at physiology guided versus angiography guided strategies. And there's going to be a very large, the, the world's largest uh, OCT intravascular uh, imaging uh, sub-study uh, within the trial. The trial, um, design, again, ultra simple design, STEMI or non-STEMI patients, they have to have at least one non-culprit lesion, more than two and a half millimeters in diameter with at least a 50% stenosis. 5,100 patients are targeted here uh, and they're randomized to receive um, either a physiology guided non-culprit lesion PCI strategy or an angiography guided non-culprit lesion PCI strategy. So we first wanna answer this question once and for all and get it off the radar. Um, there is so much, uh, you know, contradictory information right now in the literature. It depends on who you go speak and who is sponsoring the talk and so on and so forth as to which one is better. The bottom line is that we do not have an answer to this question yet. Um, so this trial will, will help us get an answer as to whether or not one, of, uh, it, one is superior to the other, but the trial itself is designed as non-inferiority. The big benefit of a physiology guided strategy, of course, is you reduce the number of non-culprit lesion PCIs by one half. That is fantastic. You actually avoid unnecessary PCI in up to one half of patients. 
Can you maintain efficacy if you do that? We don't have the questions. So this trial will help answer that question. And then built into it is the OCT study where centers that are really you know, well versed in doing intravascular imaging will be allowed to participate in the OCT study where we do, again do uh, three vessel uh, OCT imaging uh, with a view toward finding those parameters that predict uh, future cardiovascular events. Just to show you here in a, in a, in a strategy trial and you know, Judy Hockman will show you this as well when, you know, she presents the ischemia trial. It's important because there's so many small trials out there um, and, and the reliability of those trials is questionable. They can be used in meta-analyses, but really hard to use them to change guidelines. In this trial, we use the FDA guidance for how to establish non-inferiority of a physiology versus a, an angiography guided strategy we had to preserve 50% of the benefit of an angiography guided strategy versus uh, a culprit lesion only strategy. And that led us to have a non-inferiority margin that was pretty conservative at 1.28. Uh, and then our sample size is then based on that. And the sample size comes out to 5,100 patients. Now in the complete two uh, study, this study is really the missing piece of information that we have in order to really and reliably uh, guide uh, non-culprit lesion revascularization using imaging on a large scale. So we have an idea as to what may or may not be a, an unstable plaque, uh, but really this information in order to be useful has to be uh, has to go into an AI software. This eventually will be done by artificial intelligence uh, this will then be programmed into the system. It will then be correlated uh, in this trial with clinical outcome events because it's large enough in order to be able to do that. And it's over the long term. So we'll know specifically parameters like fibrous cap thickness, like lipid arc, uh, uh, like, uh, sorry, like calcium arc, uh, like the amount of lipid within the lesion. Uh, we'll be collecting all of these OCT parameters We'll be correlating them with clinical um, endpoints within the trial. Uh, that will then lead to AI software that will actually, when you image a lesion, it'll tell you the probability that lesion will have of plaque rupture and whether or not it may be worth proceeding with PCI or maybe deferring the lesion for medical management, statin therapy, PCSK9 inhibitor, et cetera. So that's the, um, the, the, the thought behind this. That's the ultimate goal. Um, embarking a, on a trial right now of just OCT guided PCI based on what we are seeing in real time. Um, maybe expert centers could do that, but on a large scale uh, rolled out across the world, that would be a bit of a gamble at this point before we have this due diligence and before we have uh, this information and hopefully we'll get that in complete too. So at that point, uh, I think I'll end Stefan and, and open it up for questions. So oh, thank you, Shamir. That was a uh, extremely uh, <clears throat> presentation based on a lot of data that you uh, guys collected. Um, I'd like um, I'd like to maybe uh, open uh, to questions, but I have just one um, one for you is uh, regarding cabbage in. Um, in complete one, like they were excluded. But do you think that if you kept cabbage as an option and given the mortality after cabbage that this could have tipped the mortality in this favor of complete revascularization? Had you, had you kept cabbage as an option for revascularization in complete trial? Perhaps um, that may have been the case, but here's why we didn't. Um, we, we, the first iteration when we were brainstorming the trial and thinking about how we would revascularize lesions, cabbage was definitely on the table. Um, in fact, Andre Lamy, who's a cardiac surgeon, uh, was 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 you know heavily involved with the trial. Um, and but but here's the thing: um, less than five percent of patients. Uh, in the STEMI setting have cabbage surgery. 
Um, and when you look at the outcomes of those patients who ultimately are referred for cabbage surgery, uh, there is uh, very high uh, mortality in those patients. Uh, very high events in general in that small number of patients with cabbage surgery that have surgical disease uh, that require it after a uh, primary PCI for STEMI, where there's been, you know, myocardial damage, you know, LV stunning, patients on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, and there's a risk of peri perisurgical bleeding. We don't know the timing of cabbage surgery. When should they go? When should you hold a P2Y12 inhibitor? Do they revascularize the culprit lesion or leave the culprit lesion alone? There are so many issues that we don't know about cabbage surgery uh, in this setting that we're trying to find out. But from a clinical trial perspective, that small group of patients would have accounted for a substantial proportion of the outcome events uh, within the trial. So it would almost have been like a tail wagging the dog scenario yeah. from a yeah. clinical trial perspective. So that's why we decided that, okay, it's, it's an important group of patients. Um, we need to track their outcomes. There's so much more we need to figure out because even the surgeons don't know. Um, so mm -hmm. it may be thus us as cardiologists that have to do the trials for the surgeons to figure out in surgical patients, you know, when should they go for surgery? Should they be allowed to recover from their STEMI first and then go to the operating room? Or should we be doing it earlier? And what do we do with the uh, P2Y12 inhibitor uh, in the perisurgical, particularly if they've had ticagrelor? You certainly don't want to send them to the operating room, uh, you know, while they're, they're on ticagrelor. Uh, maybe the reversal agent may help in this setting. So lots of questions in the surgical uh, population still to answer. Shamir, we've got a <clears throat> few questions. Uh, Chandon Deverity is asking if how CTOs uh, were edu educated in, in inclusion and exclusion and complete how revascularization was, was performed for these lesions. Right. So CTO, um, as you know, you were a center when you were uh, at McGill, uh, Stefan. CTOs were allowed in the trial, uh, but there were several caveats. If a CTO intervention uh, was to be done and it was recommended that it be done, it had to be done by a dedicated CTO op operator uh, with experience in CTO uh, revascularization uh, procedures. We did not um, want people embarking on CTOs when they did not have special training in how to open up the CTO uh, with special equipment, uh, et cetera. So uh, overall in the trial, there were under 5% of patients had a CTO. I think it was actually under 3% of patients. And of uh, those, that percentage, only about 60% had CTO interventions. We're talking about 1.5%, 1, 1. 1.6% 1. of, of the patients. overall trial. Of the yeah. overall trial. So it was a really small number. So I, you know, we haven't published the data. It was consistent. There's no heterogeneity. There's nothing striking about those data. It's just such a small patient number uh, that will eventually get around to publishing the data in that population. But it, this really was not a CTO trial. Yeah, gotcha. We uh, we got also other questions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, can you address the issue of left main as a non-culprit vessel? How how was that managed into uh, uh, complete? Again, it was allowed. It wasn't an exclusion criteria. There were, uh, you know, under 10 single digits uh, in each group that were balanced who had uh, in patients who had left main PCI. And there was no obvious heterogeneity in that, uh, in that small number of patients uh, that had left main PCI. But again, the numbers were too small in order to uh, really tell us uh, whether or not uh, there's a benefit to complete revascularization with left main PCI. My own personal opinion is if a patient does have significant uh, left main disease or bifurcation left main disease, and they're in their mid-60s, uh, then we should strongly consider cabbage. And I suspect the investigators did as well because not a lot got into the trial. Another question here is uh, from Chandon is, um, of course, you're you're focusing on ACS, which is uh, non, uh, you know, mostly STEMIs now non STEMIs. But the big question, uh, it's a bigger question, would be, uh, what do we do with uh, stable coronary disease? And does any of the data that you presented so far apply to, let's say, some or maybe a subgroup of patients with stable coronary disease? And what do we lack as data in this in this field? Yeah, the whole issue of 
stable coronary disease is interesting. I think the ischemia trial was a really important trial. Stable coronary disease, fundamentally different animal than unstable coronary disease. Unstable coronary disease, um, you know, is associated with, you know, plaque rupture, thrombus. Uh, stable coronary disease, the pathophysiology of, of plaques are very different. It's almost like asking an oncologist, like the, the corollary would be asking, this is just my personal opinion, but the way I look at it is asking an oncologist, you know, how would you treat a, a benign tumor with a malignant tumor? I mean, they're, they're both tumors, but they're very different and they have very different prognoses. Um, in stable disease, we've learned from the ischemia trial and from the courage trial that there's no benefit in terms of heart outcomes from opening up non-culprit lesions. But my question is, is that the right question we should be asking? You know, in stable coronary disease, um, really what we wanna do is improve quality of life. That's what we really wanna do. Uh, but we've led down this path that, you know, we have to show reductions in, in uh, MI and, and mortality. Um, and that's of course important. And you certainly don't wanna increase those events. You don't wanna have an increase in mortality, MI, stroke, uh, by doing revascularization, but also should that be the goal of revascularization or should it be like we look at other chronic uh, conditions to uh, improve the patient's overall well-being, um, reduce the amount of angina that they have, particularly if they're young um, and active, you know, should that be the goal? And maybe our future trials should be, um, should be focused on that, especially now that we know it's very unlikely to be harmful. I think we, we, we've seen that in ischemia and we've seen that in the COURAGE trial uh, and probably you know, beneficial based at least on the ischemia trial in terms of symptom reduction. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so it, it's a judgment issue and I think um, the reason you're doing it is, is, is very different in, in the two uh, scenarios. Uh, Greetin, you've got, <clears throat> you've got a question for, uh, for Shamir. Well, Greetin wrote uh, that, um, was there any difference in all cause death and uh, or only non-cardiac death and complete. Did you, was that, was that, did you look at overall cardiac death and was there any impact of non-cardiac death in this, in this study? Non-cardiac death was numerically lower, but not significantly lower. The only significant reduction in death that we saw was in cardiovascular death, uh, which was uh, significantly lower in the meta-analysis by Bainey. And there's another one in the European Heart Journal uh, as well. Uh, but all-cause death is numerically lower, but it's not significant. And there's another no question. increase in non-cardiac death. There's no increase in non-cardiac death. Another question is, uh, <clears throat> those MIs that were like the spontaneous MI on the, on the follow-up, how... <clears throat> Did you look at the size of these MIs in terms of, do you have any data on, you know, big MIs, proportion of these who were shocks or the, the, the size of, uh, you know, necrosis by any mean or anything? Do you have that data? Yeah, so we, we, we don't have the size of the MI. I mean, we have the initial cardiac troponin, and if um, the, the the center did additional cardiac troponins, we, you know, we we tried to collect as much information on that as possible. But we don't have any other way of directly gauging the size of the MI. What we do know about the eight type one MIs is that they almost universally led to hospital admission, uh, almost universally led to coronary angiography, and um, in a significant proportion of patients required a PCI procedure. Uh, so we do know that information about them. We did not see any difference in this trial in uh, new onset heart failure. So heart failure did not differ uh, at all between the two groups. And whether that was a function of our diagnosis of heart failure or whether that's a true finding um, is uncertain. In complete two, we are, we are changing our definition of heart failure to be more in line with some of the heart failure trials that have been done. Uh, so we'll be able to maybe unravel a little bit more, but uh, no, we did not see a difference in, in heart failure between the two groups. So uh, Shamir, um, we filled this hour with 
incredible incredible data and 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 depth in understanding in uh, what's going on in ACS. I think everybody uh, gained a lot uh, of knowledge and uh, depth in their understanding of what's going on. And uh, on behalf of the whole uh, cardiology division here at Emory, we want to thank you so much for your presence and your great talk this morning. It was uh, absolutely uh, uh, <coughs> stellar. And uh, we wish you uh, uh, a very nice uh, TCT planning uh, over the next few days uh, in New York. And hopefully we'll have the chance to have you again in the future uh, to speak uh, on complete two or any other uh, topic of your choice here at, at Emory, it would, uh, it would be uh, fantastic. So thank you again, Shamir. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan, and take care, everyone. Thanks. All for right. Having... Have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.